Um, my name is Carl Wordsworth, and I'm head of water for Tulsud NEL. Um, NEL are part of the National Measurement System, um, and that basically is a government organisation uh, that promotes research and development for the UK industry. Um, first of all, I'll just explain briefly, um, give you some information about the National Measurement Instru uh, System, then talk about why measurement is necessary, uh, look at calibration, uncertainty and traceability, um, the fundamentals of flow, uh, flow measurement technology and then flow meter selection. What I should say is that this uh, one hour presentation is uh, typically given as a, a full day course. Uh, we actually operate a full full day training course on this. So we've had to squeeze um, a full day's presentation into this one hour. So there will be things that I'll, I'll have missed or things that, that are not in this that will be in the full uh, presentation. Uh, briefly, I'll just give you an idea of who Tufsud NELR are. Um, Tufsud is a German testing, inspection and calibration company. Um, got a turnover of about 2.4 billion euros a year with over 25,000 employees uh, and they issue about 574,000 uh, certificates per year. We are the National Engineering Laboratory uh, and we're based in East Kilbride in Scotland. Um, NEL was originally uh, set up in the in the late 40s as a government research association um, and then we were bought by Tufsud in uh, 1995 um, and as I said we're part of the national measurement um, system and what that does is basically that gives uh, the government pay us every year to maintain our testing facilities maintain the traceability and the maintenance of these facilities um, so that the industry has uh, a place uh, so the UK industry can come visit our facilities, test that equipment on them, and we have the uh, uh, as low measurement uncertainty on our facilities as possible. Um, we uh, we have about eight engineers um, with about ten PhD students, um, but, but our main aim, our main purpose, really, is looking at accuracy and traceability of the uh, the test facilities that we maintain. The National Measurement System is made up from six companies. Uh, you'll probably all have heard of NPL. Uh, and every year, Bayes pays about 65 million pounds into these companies um, to help maintain their facilities uh, and to, for us to uh, undertake basic R&D for, for UK industry. So any, any work that we under do under, that, under what we call the Flow Programme project is available to UK industry. Uh, it's available on our website and anybody can get hold of it. And what it means is that uh, NEL are basically the uh, designated institute for flow. So we hold the flow standards for the UK government, which means that we have a series of test facilities, as you can see in these two buildings here, um, that have very, very low uh, measurement uncertainty on them. So we have um, traceability on all the instruments back to uh, national standards. Um, and we spend an awful lot of time and money maintaining the traceability, maintaining the calibration, um, and maintaining um, the facilities themselves so they're always available for uh, the UK industry. So you can see we have a range of test facilities. We have uh, in, the, in, in the big building at the bottom there, we have the water test facility uh, and the advanced multi-phase test facility. We also have erosion and CO2 facilities um, and oil um, and uh, what we call EPAT, which is the elevated pressure and temperature facility which is designed specifically for testing Coriolis meters. So, so why, why is me measurement important? Well, in almost every aspect of everyday life, measurement is important. Whether you're catching a train, buying petrol, taking medication, having a pint, or even building a bridge, measurement is important that you uh, that everybody uses the same measurement standards um, and everybody knows how accurate the measurement actually is. In the UK, um, nearly 800 billion pound of uh, goods, including gas, electricity, uh, are sold on the basis of these measurements every year. Um, and therefore, when you, when you have a financial aspect of anything you're selling uh, or measuring, the actual accuracy or the or the, the measurement uncertainty of that uh, measurement is a 
is of vital importance because you have to be sure that you're paying the correct amount for the correct product that you're purchasing. So, um, I'll just talk a little bit about calibration, uh, traceability and uncertainty. So calibration is basically the, uh, the process of establishing the, the, the specific conditions on a, on a piece of instrumentation and the relationship between the values of quantities indicated by measuring instrument or measuring systems and the corresponding values raised by standards. And all this means really is that when you undertake a calibration of say a flow meter, you would put it into a, a test facility like the one shown here on, on the right hand side and you would actually measure the flow rate through that test, uh, through, through your flow meter and use a series of reference meters that have been calibrated. The, the, the historical data of the, those flow meters are well known. They have full traceability of, um, of all the measurements and all the historical data. So we have, we know that from, our, from all of the work that we do, the measurement uncertainty of that test facility is very low. Um, and therefore, when you test a, a meter in that facility, that measurement uncertainty can, is transferred to your device. The rig on the, the rig shown on the right hand side there is um, our oil test facility up in East Cove Ride. Um, and that has a measurement uncertainty of about 0.1%. I think it's 0.1 or 0.2%. And what that means is basically the, the reference meters that are placed on that rig have been calibrated over many, many years. We know the full historical um, traceability of them. And they've been uh, calibrated against, if you can see, on the right hand picture there you can see those orange things in the very far distance they're a gravimetric weighing system so what that means is basically actually we weigh the amount of fluids passing through the system uh, and that's much more accurate than using the flow meter and then we use those gravimetric systems to actually um, calibrate our reference meters and then we use the reference meters to calibrate any custom uh, calibration devices This just talks a little bit about measurement uncertainty. Um, I'll go into much more detail on this in the second presentation. But measurement uncertainty is actually the quant quantification of accuracy. When people quote ac accuracy for the device, it's actually just a qualitative term. It doesn't have any actual measurement with it. Whereas for a, an uncertainty, you have to have three things. You have to have the measured value, the uncertainty, and the confidence level. So you can see from the example that's shown there, one kilogram is the measured value, plus or minus 10 grams is the uncertainty, and 95% is the confidence level. And all that means is that the one kilo sample that, you'll take, that you take, you are certain that within that the actual true value lies within plus or minus 10 degrees of that rate of that value with a 95% confidence. So you can see the standard, uh, the uh, normal distribution graph on the uh, right hand side and 95% confidence level limits represent roughly two standard deviations. So when you do a statistical analysis of the data that you generate, you're within two, plus or minus two standard deviations, sure that the, that the true answer will lie um, within that range. We'll go into this in much more detail in the second presentation. Well, this is important because the true value of any measurement can never be known. All you're doing is actually estimating the value based on the instrumentation that you've got and the measurement uncertainty of the instrument itself. There will always be a potential error in any measurement you make. Uh, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the second presentation. It's important that when you're actually using any measurement device, you uh, actually make sure that the, the device you use is actually um, fit for purpose. So for example, if you were measuring tomatoes with a, a price of two pound per kilo, uh, a plus or minus 10 gram discrepancy would only relate to 2p. So you, that, 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 that would, the uncertainty of that device would be good enough if you were measuring uh, tomatoes. If you then take that example for gold, 
where the kilo can weigh uh, can cost thirty-seven thousand pound. If you have a, a plus or minus ten percent discrepancy, that's three hundred and seventy pound. So therefore, that the same instrument cannot be used for both device for both measurements. You would need a much lower uncertainty measurement for the gold. And what you would actually need is you would actually need um, where you've got plus or minus ten grams there. You would actually need down into the milligram range in order to have the same level of uh, consequence from the uncertainty. This just goes into a little bit of detail about what we what we call traceability. And all traceability is it means that you have historical data on every instrument that's on your test facility and every instrument has been calibrated back to a national standard in our, in our case. And as you go up the traceability uh, pyramid, the cost for maintaining that facility and the cost for actually getting the very low levels of uncertainty, uncertainty that you can see on the right hand side um, increased massively. So you can see we're uh, part of a National Measurement Institute. So we're aiming to get all our test facilities with measurement uncertainty down to 0.05%. To do that, it's very, very expensive. Um, you have to spend an awful lot of money calibrating instrumentation, maintaining them, um, having the, their historical performance over their entire life. And this is why the UK government pay NEL to actually undertake um, and maintain the facilities that we have. Um, and because it is quite an expensive uh, process to do. You can see as you actually go down the traceability chain, you know, company, uh, for, for, for example, four meter manufacturers may have um, test facilities capable of a 0.5% uh, uncertainty which is good enough for their instruments, but because we're the National Measurement Institute, we've got to be better than the company uh, instruments. So we have to maintain those facilities with that very, very low level. So some fundamentals of flow measurement. Um, you can measure a lot of different things in terms of when you talk about flow, you can measure point velocities, the volumetric flow rate, um, the mass flow rate, the total quantity of volume of mass passed through the device or if you're dealing with gas you can look at actual or standard volumes one of the important things to re re realize is density when you're measure making these measurements and how do you and how you can swap between mass and uh, mass flow and volumetric flow and obviously density is just simply the mass divided by the volume uh, it's also important to realize that density varies with both pressure and temperature um, and that obviously when you're when you're calibrating um, flow meters to the lowest levels of uncertainty possible you have to take into the density uh, of the facility uh, sorry the density of the fluids being used and the pr pressure and temperature of the uh, facility because they can all affect um, the actual flow measurements that you make viscosity is another important factor that you need to consider Discussing is just the resistance of fluids being deformed by shear stress. You can tend to think of viscosity as just the thickness of the fluid. So, for example, honey has a very high viscosity, whereas water has a viscosity of one centipoise, and it's just really the thickness when you're considering the fluids. This, the, the actual viscosity of the fluid, also plays into the, the, the Reynolds number, which I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail later. And the Reynolds number gives you an idea of what flow regime you're actually in when you're in the pipe. And it's important that you, when you're actually calibrating any equipment, you, you try to calibrate them under the same conditions that they're going to see and practice in the field. Because there's no point calibrating a flow meter under ideal conditions uh, in a labo laboratory when you know it's not going to see those same conditions uh, in practice in the field. So the Reynolds number. Simply, it's just the density of the fluid times the velocity divided by the pipe diameter divided by the dynamic viscosity. And what that does is it gives you an idea of the turbulence within your flow, within your liquid uh, and, uh, and allows you to actually determine if you're in the laminar, the transitional or the turbulent re regime. And this is important for us when we're doing the calibrations because sometimes, um, particularly in the oil and gas industry, an oil company will come to us and say, we want to match the, the flow meter calibration over a certain Reynolds number range because that's what they see in practice in the field in, with their 
because their oil can vary in terms of pressure, temperature and viscosity. So we can then match uh, the calibration conditions that we test in the lab uh, using the Reynolds number to make sure that we calibrate the instrument over the correct flow range. This just shows you the, uh, the, the differences in the Reynolds numbers. Generally, if you're below 2000, you're going to be in the laminar flow range. And you can see you've got, you've got nice streamlined flow in the pipeline. Between 2000 and 4000, you're in what's called the transitional flow. And that basically switches between laminar and transitional uh, and turbulent flow. And you really don't want to be in that range if, if at all possible, because that makes measurement quite difficult because it's, it's always swapping between the two um, flow regimes. And then generally when you get above 4,000, you're in the turbulent flow region. And this is typically where most operators are, are operate. Um, and this is typically, uh, you know, the, the, the standard conditions that we, we, we test our device, any calibrations with are typically tested in the turbulent flow regime. This just shows you a simple um, schematic showing the, 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 the flow pattern, the, 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 yeah, the flow patterns that you would see in the pipeline. So for laminar, you can see you've got nice streamlined flow, um, no disturbances, and the flow just flows smoothly through the pipe. With turbulent flow, you can see it's much more chaotic. Um, the streamlines are much more disturbed and complex. Um, when you have flow meters, it's, it's important to realize that the upstream um, conditions that you have in the pipeline can have an effect on the performance of the meter. For example, if you've got bends, T's, valves upstream of your device, um, that can create disturbances in the flow profile. So typically what you would expect to see, what, what you would like to see is the top picture where you have a fully developed flow profile. And here you can see you've got nice streamlined flow, uh, a, a symmetrical flow within the pipe. And this is typically how you would want to uh, make any measurements under that, under that flow profile. But you can see on the picture on the left here, by introducing a bend into the uh, flow, flow line, you distort the flow within the pipe and then you can for, you can get uh, asymmetrical or skewed, skewed flow profiles. Most modern flow meters assume that you've got the fully formed, uh, fully developed flow profile. So when you've got a, a, an asymmetric or skewed flow profile, that can seriously affect the performance of the meter. So it's important to know that when you're actually installing a flow meter, you install it under the manufacturer's recommendations with the required upstream, downstream, straight length sections, because that's been tested by the manufacturer to ensure that um, that flow meter will perform under optimum conditions with those straight sections of pipe. One of the important things that we uh, we have found is, and this is some CFD that's been undertaken on uh, quite large pipe up to 600 mil, is that swirl uh, which can be created introduced into the flow by uh, the bend can actually be distributed quite long distances of down the length of the pipe the cfd at the top showed that it was actually extending uh, more than 100 diameters downstream of the pipe um, so obviously if you had a bend in a large diameter pipe and then a flow meter you are going to see disturbed flow entering your flow meter so what you actually want is, is the picture at the bottom there, you want fully developed flow. Um, and I, again, that shows you the skewed profile on the, on the left hand side, which you, which you want to try to avoid if at all possible. And different disturbances will have different effects on different flow meters. Some flow meters are more susceptible to a swirl. Some are more susceptible to a, an asymmetric skewed path. Um, so it's important to have a good idea of the flow profile in your pipeline when you're actually looking to um, install or purchase a new flow meter. This just illustrates the what we were just saying there where the top picture shows you what the manufacturer would recommend. So they would recommend either 5 or 10D upstream of the flow meter to be a straight section of pipe and then between two and five diameters downstream um, 
again straight length of pipe if you have the picture in reality that's on the bottom where you've got multiple bends valves uh, that can seriously affect the performance of the flow meter um, and take it uh, and in, in, in actual fact take it quite a large range outside its uh, state of uncertainty measurement that the manufacturer will give you so it's important to uh, where possible uh, maintain the straight section of pipe now of course this isn't this isn't always possible particularly when you're in the field or you know when you've got a complex pipeline so it's important to realize that if you do have a, a complex upstream hydrodynamic uh, pitch like we have here that will affect the performance of your flow meter there are things you can do to uh, to avoid uh, that having a, an effect you can put things like straighteners in the pipe which actually straighten the flow profile so you're seeing a nice flow profile into your uh, into your meter or you can actually try to calibrate the meter under similar conditions that you see in the field so if you know you've got a bend immediately upstream of the, the flow meter you can actually calibrate the, the flow meter with that same bend in the same position and that way you're calibrating the flow meter uh, under the real life conditions that you'll see in the field So what I'll do now is briefly go through some of the, the flow measurement technologies. Um, these are just for, these are just generalised. They're not specific to any particular manufacturer. Some of the numbers we quote are just again just generalised. Uh, and meat manufacturers are always bringing out new products. So if you actually want to purchase or install a new flow meter, it's always best to speak to the flow meter manufacturers because they're the best people. They know their uh, meters inside out. And, and so long as you give them all the information, such as the, the, the upstream pipe uh, pictures that we've just seen then, as long as you tell them that there's a disturbed pipe, they can help you get the best technology for your situation. So we typically um, divide the flow meters up into the traditional and modern flow meters. So the traditional meters are more uh, meters with moving parts uh, and older types of meters like differential pressure, positive displacement and turbines. And the modern meters are more meters that they not only produce the, um, they not only give you the flow rate of the fluid passing through your device, they also provide meter diagnostics that can be used to help um, determine the performance of the meter. So the, the, the meter diagnostics will actually change as the, the flow within the pipe um, changes. And we've done an awful lot of testing uh, up at NEL on looking at both Coriolis and ultrasonic meters, where we've introduced a number of upstream disturbances into them, looking at things like bends, T's, valves. In the case of ultrasonics, we've looked at uh, waxing and putting uh, wax on the transducer. And what that does is it allows you to use something called condition-based monitoring. Uh, to actually have a live understanding of the performance of the meter because that diagnostic data that's been generated can be extracted and we can look at that to look at see how the meter is performing over time it also allows us to look at, to see if there's any uh, calibration drift over time as well and we can use that to actually determine when calibration uh, when, when, when the meter calibration should actually be undertaken because typically meter manufacturers will suggest you calibrate these things yearly Sometimes that's not required depending on the situation. And by using the condition-based monitoring and looking at the, the diagnostics of the flow meter, you can potentially extend that calibration period uh, and therefore save money and time. So, um, first of all, differential pressure transmitters. Uh, these are probably the simplest flow meters that you'll ever see in practice. And they cover things like orifice plates, venturis, wedge meters, and they operate simply by introducing a, a disturbance or a restriction in the pipe flow, and then you measure the differential pressure across that, uh, that um, restriction, uh, and basically use Bernoulli's equation to calculate the flow. These are probably the most simple and, cost, and, and low cost examples of flow meters that you'll, you'll see. So you can see from the equation that you've got there, when you have a reduction in the pipe, by measuring the differential pressure between the, uh, the, 
the upstream and downstream of the reduction, you can calculate the um, pressure loss and therefore you can calculate the flow. Because the difference in pressure is proportional to the square of the flow rate. Now a huge amount of work has been done on this type of equipment. Um, you can see this, the, the, the British standard there is ISO 5167. Um, and typically if you have an orifice plate in place, so long as it's been manufactured to the um, correct standards under the correct manufacturing process, you can actually use an orifice plate without any calibration because the meters are so well, because the meters are so well understood, um, you can just test them straight off as soon as they're uh, manufactured. Simple picture of a, um, an orifice plate on the, on the picture there. And you can see that basically all it is, is it, it's just a plate in the uh, pipeline that has a hole in it. And by looking at the ratio of the, uh, the hole in the pipe to the, sorry, the hole in the plate to the hole in the pipe, you can use the equation that's shown at the bottom there to calculate the flow through the device. Um, they have to be specifically manufactured to, to the correct British standard. Uh, and plates are normally between three and 12 millimeters thick, and they're usually just sandwiched between um, flanges. As I said, there's been a huge amount of work undertaken on these over the years. And the picture here shows um, for different beta ratios, by you can introduce a number of different disturbances upstream of the pipe. And that will get, then give you the effect on the, on the performance of the device by changing the upstream and downstream distance, straight distances you need from the disturbance to your flow meter. So you can see with a beta ratio of say 0.5, if you have a single 90 degree bend, it goes all the way up to 22 diameters upstream and nine diameters downstream. And, that, and this table is actually in the standard itself. So you can actually see this information in the standard. And it just shows how much, if may, how much data has been produced on these and uh, how well understood the four meters are. So uh, generally they can be used for both gas and liquids. Um, they have uncertainties of between 0.6 and 2%. They're quite re repeatable with a re re repeatability of 0.5%. But well, they do suffer from turn, a sort of low turn down ratio. So what that means is you, if you have a specific flow that the meter is designed for, that can only go to, to three to one, to three times that flow before it starts to fail. You can increase the turn down ratio of um, orifice plates by having multiple differential pressure meters in place. So rather than having a single, rather than having a single measurement of uh, differential pressure across the device, if you have a range of um, devices to measure a range of differential pressures, you can extend the, uh, the turn down ratio and make them, and make them cover a more useful uh, flow rate range. Positive displacement devices. Um, these are quite complex in terms of moving parts. You can see on the picture that's moving there, what they actually do is they take a, a pocket of fluid through the device by uh, the rotation of a pair of gears in this case. And the, the actual volume that's being transferred is accurately known. So therefore, from the number of rev revolutions of the gears, you can work out the overall flow rate through the device. Um, there are many types of devices, uh, diaphragms, lobes, oscillating pist pistons, helical oval gear, um, and they are, so they are, they are, um, they are very useful. Um, they do suffer from problems in the fact that if you have any solids in there, they can quite quickly jam up. So yeah, they have to be used with very clean fluids. Um, you can see from the pitch there, that they, can, they can go to any sizes. I've used these down to, I think, between an inch and it, between half inch and an inch, and you can see the size of the one being worked on there. They're very accurate because they're actually transferring fluid through a, of a known volume through a number of revolutions uh, inside the device, and by counting the number of uh, rotations of the, uh, the, 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 the screw, you can actually calculate quite an accurate volume. 
again solids are a major problem because you can see the tolerances involved in the two um two lobes there are quite small so if you get any solids jammed in there they can quite quickly jam up the device and stop it from working you've got to be careful not to overspin um the actual lobes because that can then represent a, an untrue value of flow that you may see but they are repeatable they're good for batch processing and unlike many flow meters, they don't suffer from any insulation effects. As I mentioned previously, if you have a complex hydrodynamic uh, profile upstream of your measurement device, that will affect the performance. Because, press, because this type of pressure uh, positive displacement device is actually taking a known volume through the actual device by the rotation of the, of the gear, it doesn't matter how the flow profile comes in. Uh, it can be, you know, it can be very disturbed. It be, can be very uh, asymmetrical because you just take a known volume within the liquid. So they're very good if you have a very complex upstream pipeline that you need to consider. So typically, they can be used for both liquid and gas. Uh, they have uncertainties between 0.1 to 0.5 percent. Again. These are just generalized, different devices. It's, it's, very, it's quite difficult to actually come up with this table for the whole, whole range because there's so many different types of device available. But typically, you get an uncertainty between 0.1 and 0.5. You can get repeatabilities down to 0 0.2, 0 0.02, so they are very accurate. And they have a slightly higher turndown ratio than orifice plates. This is probably one of the most common ones that you'll see in the uh, water industry. Um, turbine meter where simply all you have is you have the flow passing through the device um, which rotates an impeller within the, within the uh, meter itself. And by counting the number of rotations, you get a pulsed output and, that, and from there you can determine the flow rate of liquid passing through your meter. So the flow rate that's passing through there is proportional to the rotor speed and therefore if you count uh, the, number of the number of pulses generated by the uh, rotation of the impeller you can quite quickly calculate the quantity of fluid passing through the device. These again are quite accurate devices, they, they, they have been used for uh, fiscal applications in hydrocarbons, they're good for long steady flow rates. Um, they have very good re re repeatability, uh, they're very easy to install and con compared to some other flow meters their, their price is considered average. So they can be used for both liquid and gas. They have an uncertainty of between 0.1 and 2% depending on the type uh, of, the, of meter that you use. They're very re repeatable. Uh, down to 0 0.02 and again they have a similar turn down ratio to the positive displacement devices at 10 to 1. If we now move to some of the more modern types of flow meter um, this is the electromagnetic meter that's used an awful lot in the watch industry you can see from the picture at the bottom there what actually happens is the flow passes through the device perpendicular to a magnetic field and using Faraday's law that will generate a voltage. So you can see the pitch, the, the little graph at the bottom there. As you increase the flow rate of gas, oh, sorry, the flow rate of liquid through the device, the voltage is proportional to the flow, and therefore it's very easy to uh, to calibrate. Um, and they're very usually very accurate devices. So typically the voltage is just proportional to the flow, uh, and therefore the, the higher the flow through the device, the bigger the voltage that's generated. Typically there's two types that are used. Um, full bore, which is as it says just, a, just the, the same size as the pipeline. Um, that has the advantage of reduced pressure loss because you don't have any disturbances in your pipe. Um, one of the other one of the disadvantages is that you do need to look at your upstream and downstream piping because the um, they are susceptible to um, disruptions in the in, in the flow. The reduced bore is simply um, the flow meter will have two reducers inside the meter and reduce the actual pipe diameter. 
And what that does is that actually allows you to increase the local velocity within the device, means that you, meaning that you can actually use it for measuring lower flows. And that will also help um, correct for any disturbances that you may see from your upstream pipeline. The disadvantages are that it's got an increased pressure loss. Um, some meter manufacturers are now quoting zero D electromagnetic meters, which means you can place them immediately downstream of a bend or a disturbance. Um, because of that reduction actually increases the, velocity, the local velocity so much that it that will actually uh, handle any upstream disturbances you may see. The main issue with the electromagnetic flow meters is they've got to be used on a conductive fluid. So they can only really be used on water or water-based fluids um, because water is very uh, conductive. So you can't use them on distilled, so they're not very good for um, this, this desalination plants, things like that. And they really can't be using oil and gas either because oil and gas are non-conductive fluids. The measurement that you get from the meter isn't dependent on pressure or temperature. It's not affected by viscosity because you're using the full bore of the pipeline. The velocity is linear against voltage. So the flow is, is, is linear against the voltage. So they're very easy to calibrate. And the full bore system is a very low pressure system. <coughs> Sorry about that. So in general, they can be used for water. They have uncertainties of between 0 0.2, 0 0.2 and 1%. Good repeatability at 0.1%. But well, the advantage they do have is they can be used with turn down ratios of 100 to 1, which is much higher than the previous meters that we've seen. Now this is a meter that's generally not used too much in the water industry, but it is used heavily in the oil and gas industry, and that's the Coriolis meter. And the Coriolis meter works by having two tubes within the device that are oscillated uh, at the natural frequency of the, of the device. And as fluid passes through those um, pipes, that changes the oscillation. So you can actually measure the, the difference in the, the oscillation of the two tubes and that, that will give you the mixture density and also the mass flow rate through the device. Again, that just explains a little bit more about it. You can see the coil there that, that actually generates the, the sound wave for the, the two um, ro vibrating tubes. And that vibration can, uh, and the change in that profile can be measured very accurately. Uh, so you can get quite accurate measurements from the device. So they can be used for metering oil. They're good for low or high viscosity fluids. They're good for process fluids, um, good for gas as well, and generally used where you need a high accuracy application. So the performance, they can be used for both gas and liquids. They're very accurate, so they've got very low uncertainties. They've got very good rep rep repeatability, and they have a very good turn down ratio. The issue that they, they do have is they are very expensive. Typically, when you start moving to larger diameters, they can get expensive very quickly. The final meter that I'll talk about is the ultrasonic flow meter. And typically, that is made up of uh, two different types, either wetted or clamp-on. Um, the wetted device it, it simply means that the, the ultrasonic transducer that's generating the, the pulses in the pipe is actually in contact with the fluid. So you can see it's got a little port uh, in, in the pipe that allows it to get in contact with the fluid. The clamp on is actually just clamped to the outside of the pipe. Um, so it's not in contact with the fluid, but you, that, you therefore need more power because you've got to send the signal um, through the pipe wall. Therefore, you've got a weaker signal to detect and therefore they're not quite as accurate as the, um, the wetted type of meter. Generally, you can use two different uh, measurements. You either just measure the, the, um, the, the time for the pulse from transducer to transducer as in the top, or you can actually bounce it off the wall 
and measure the, uh, the, the times it takes to go from one transmitter to another. This just shows you um, an example of what's known as transit time meters. So what you do is you send a pulse from one transmitter to another, first of all along the direction of flow of the device, and then you send another pulse from the second transmitter back across, uh, against the direction of flow. And by looking at the differences in, sorry, the differences in time between the two pulses, you can work out the flow rate in the actual device. A second type of meter is called a Doppler meter. And in this case, you actually need particles in your, in your, in your uh, fluid flow, either air bubbles or solid particles. And what this does is it actually, the ultrasonic pulse actually bounces off those particles and it uses that bounce time in order to calculate the flow. So you can see that the pulse has hit, hit the particle and then bounces off it and returns to the transducer. So these are quite useful if you don't have clean fluids um, and if you know you have potentially solids or gas bubbles in your, in your fluids. Typically, um, or it, when, when ultrasonics were first brought out, they, they used a single path approach where you just had the uh, transducers opposite each other. Now the problem with that is if you've got an asymmetric flow in your pipeline and you only have that point to point measurement, there's every likelihood you're not going to see any dif difference in your disturbance of your flow. So it would actually be measuring, it won't actually measure the actual flow, it will measure just what, what it expects all that point to point um, beam. By increasing the number of beams in the technology, you therefore stand a much better chance of actually identifying any asymmetry in your pipe flow. Um, the problem is the more beams you add, the more expensive the device becomes. Uh, but they do give much higher accuracy um, devices. As, I said, as we say there, typically with a single beam uh, ultrasonic measurement, you're going to be looking to get a 2 to 3% measurement uncertainty from your device. So they can be used for both gas and liquid. Um, uncertainty of between 0.1 to 5%. Obviously, at 5%, they're the, the clamp on type meters. They have good re repeatability and they do have very high turndown ratios because all you're doing is just, you're just bouncing a, a signal through the pipeline and it's just re relating that signal time um, to the flow. So they do they can be used over much longer, much larger uh, flow rate ranges. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit about flow meter selection. Sorry about this, it's just I've got a heater up there, down pointy directly at me, it's quite warm. Um, So, when you're trying to actually determine what flow meter to use, it, it's often a, a case of elimination. Um, and often you can come up with a case where two or three different flow meters will be suitable for, the, for your application. Um, but some of, the, some of the questions you have to ask yourself are, what, do you, what, what output do you require? Do you need a mass flow, a volumetric flow, a point velocity, do you need density? Because that will then point you to a certain type of flow meter in the in those shown there. What fluid type do you have? Do you have liquid or gas? Certain flow meters are only um, useful for liquid meters, uh, for for liquid. So others are useful for both. What's your operating conditions? Do you have a very high turndown ratio? Do you have high temperature or pressure ranges? What uncertainty do you need? Just how accurate do you need the device to be? Because obviously that will determine which of the devices you, you, you might choose. Your operating environment. Um, do you know if you've got very complex upstream pipe, uh, pipe disturbances? Do you know if you've got the, 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 the right straight section of the pipe upstream and downstream as recommended by the manufacturer? Budget. The, 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 the cost of these flow meters vary wildly, depending on the type and size of meter that you're interested in. And also if you have any installation or maintenance requirements. So you can see you've got to consider quite a few different uh, things before you start choosing which flow meter to use.
at the end of that initial investigation, you'll probably have maybe one or two meter types that you can you can look at. What you, what you should do then is go back and revisit the selection criteria. And the next question you should ask is, do you actually need to make the measurement? Do you need to put a flow meter there? Sometimes you, you might not need one. And it's always best to take advice. So once you've identified a particular type of flow meter that you're interested in, speak to the meter manufacturers. Give them all your information. They'll tell you that they, they will give you a meter that will be specific for your application. Um, they're the people that know their meters best. And that, that should then allow you to actually determine which flow meter type you, 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 you should use. So in summary, do you need a meter? Do you have to make the measurement where you think you need to make the measurement? How uncertain or accurate do you need the meter to be? Because again, that will determine which of the type of meters you may be looking at. What are the fluids? Do you have any upstream disturbances that are going to create a, a disturbed flow profile into your device? What do you know about the flow? What do you know about the flow meters? Um, and then typically, like I said, this is giving us a, a one day course. So we actually then go on to explain about how these meters should be managed, how they should be maintained. Uh, but, but that's not covered here, unfortunately. And that's it. I mean, that's basically a whistle, whistle stop tour of flow meters. Um, do you have any questions? Yes. Oh. Uh, we used to do an awful lot of work on um, open channels back in the 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, so it's quite a long time ago now. We haven't done as much recently because at, at that time we moved more to the oil and gas industry. So we concentrated mainly on pipe. But there, is, there should be an awful lot of information on our website for the open channel work that we used to do in, in the past. I mean, we are considering looking at this again because obviously that's something that, you know, that's now becoming more important. Again, the open channel measurement. Um, so yeah, but, but, but there are other companies out there that do actually do a lot of the open channel measurements like WRC. Um, so we have the national standard for flow, yes, but it, that doesn't specify open channel, unfortunately. It's just pipe channel mainly with UCAS. So, but yes, I mean, that is something that we are looking into whether we need to start revisiting the work we did maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's always best if you're going to calibrate any of these flow meters to try and simulate the real conditions that you're going to see in, in, in the field, because there's no point calibrating a flow meter under ideal conditions and then putting it into, a, into the field where you know you've got a complex pipeline upstream of it, because all you're going to do is you, you, the, the, the results aren't going to be the same as the calibration results. So we have facilities up at NEL that we can actually model whatever you have in your pipeline so they're actually calibrated under real conditions. And it's always best to do that if it's all possible. No? Okay. We'll go on to the second Yeah, we can start part three now. Okay, in, in the first presentation, we actually measured, sorry, we mentioned measurement uncertainty. 
Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail now on what the measurement uncertainty is and how you go about calculating it. Again, this is typically a one day course that we offer. Um, so to cut it down to one hour has been quite difficult. Um, so there are probably things that I've missed that aren't included in there. And if there's things that I haven't covered that you're interested in, just contact me and we can always, we can always give you more information about it. So, um, we'll cover some of the basic uh, theory and some of the basic terms that are used in uncertainty. Give you an idea of the cost of, of errors by, make, by, by having a measurement uncertainty the types of uncertainty and I'll, I'll give you a brief a very short explanation and a, a, a description of how an uncertainty should be calculate, calculated if you're going to undertake uncertainty measurement the best document to consult is what's known as the GUM or the guide to the expression of uncertainty measurement now this is a, a, a standard that was produced I think back in the 70s Oh no, oh, there's been updates there in 2008. And that works through the entire process of calculating measurement uncertainty. You might also be interested to know that we've actually, um, with the IWA digital section, we're actually producing a white paper on measurement uncertainty. It goes through the process and explains what the various terms are. That's currently going through our internal checking process, should, so it should be with the IWA quite soon. Which should be then be available on their website if you're interested in measurement uncertainty. So, as I said in the um, in the first presentation, the true value of any measurement is always unknown. All you're doing is you're making a, a, an estimate of the of the value based on the uncertainty of the device that you're using to measure. So as you can see from this picture here, the indicated value is in green, the true value is in black, and you have this uncertainty band of where the true value may lie within the indicated value. And it's this uncertainty that's used for, um, to, to actually, as we described previously, where you have the, the three terms to, to determine, I keep saying accuracy, but it's not the accuracy, it's actually the uncertainty. So you'll have, and what you can actually do is have you can you can have different bands of, un of uncertainty and what these refer to is if you have a standard distribution a normal distribution the 68 95 and 100 percent refer to one two and three standard deviations on that normal distribution and obviously the, the higher the value that you give on the confidence the greater the range that you're expected to see between the true value and the the measured value Typically, we use two um, uncertainties. 68% is called the standard deviation, so the standard uncertainty. And that represents the, the confidence limit at 68%, so that's one standard deviation on a normal distribution. The expanded um, uncertainty, which is often quoted by manufacturers, gives you the same, but a 95% confidence level limit. So it gives you a greater range over which the, the true value may lie within your measured value. To get from one to the other, it's very simple. There's just a simple ca calculation there. To get from the, um, the standard uncertainty to the expanded uncertainty, you just times by the coverage factor. And the coverage factor is just basically the, the, the number of standard deviations. So for 68%, that'll be one. For 95%, it's, it's 1.96, although typically it's quoted as being 2. And this allows you to then to, to, to estimate what band that your measurement may, like, may, may likely lie within, uh, given the, uh, the confidence limits that's, that, are, that are quoted. So as I said in the first presentation, for a, an uncertainty, you need three things. You need the measured value, in this case 3.5, uh, 
you need the uncertainty value, which is in this case point, plus or minus 0.2 liters per second. And you also need the confidence limit, which, which in this case is quoted as being 95% confidence. And that gives you the measurement uncertainty of that particular measurement that you've made. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of meter manufacturers will call accuracies. And accuracy is just a qualitative term. Uh, they should really quote uncertainty because that's actually a quantified term. Um, but not many people understand the difference between accuracy and measurement uncertainty. So it's, it, it, in industry, it's tend, it tends to be a, a term that can be used either way. But under ideal conditions, they should be quoting measurement uncertainties and not accuracies. So, in that case there, in that case there, we had a measurement uncertainty of 3.5 plus or minus 0.2 with a 95% confidence limit. And what that actually represents is, that means that the true value of the measurement could lie anywhere between 3.3 and 3.7, because our measured value was 3.5. The other thing to consider are things called uh, uh, like the error, um, and, and, and the error is often referred to as the difference between the measured result and the, con and, and the conventional true value. Now, we've just said that the true value could never be known, but if you have a if you make the measurement against a highly referenced standard, so you know you basically you, your your device has been calibrated against a, a standard that has a very low uncertainty. That low uncertainty then is then transferred to your device, which means that your device measures under the same uncertainty. So you can actually you, you can determine the, the true value based on the, the confidence limits because you know where it's going to lie in between that range. Other things we have to consider are accuracy. As I've mentioned, you can't attach a value to accuracy, it's just a qualitative term although most meter manufacturers actually quote accuracy with a percentage. Repeatability, and that's just the closeness of any measurements that are made under the same conditions at the same time. And you can see from the little picture that all, um, they all agree with each other quite accurately. Now, good accuracy means good repeatability, as you can see from the top picture. Well, you can have poor repeat, repeatability and poor accuracy, but good re repeatability does not necessarily, necessarily mean good accuracy. So you can see from the picture here, all the values are very re repeatable, but they're not accurate in terms of where they should be. You can also have bias on any measurements that you make, um, and this will affect the measurement the same way uh, every time. So you can see they're all grouped together and the difference between the expected true value and the bias uh, and, and the actual value is your bias. We also have resolution errors. So obviously the resolution of your particular meter can have an effect on the, the measurement that you get. For example, if your floor meter is only measuring uh, to 35 milliliters per second, that means that the actual uncertainty will be is between 34.5 and 35.5 just based on the resolution of the device because that will actually the, third, the, the reading of 35 will occur at any at any point between that range but if you have 35.0 as a resolution on your device that means that the actual um, the, the band away your the reading could actually be will actually be 35 sorry 30, 34.95 and 35.05. So you can see it's bad in that one extra decimal place you do improve the, the band where the error, or sorry, where the actual true value could lie. And it's important to make sure that you use the, the right level of um, resolution for the right level of measurement that you need. For example, there's no point using a very accurate device when you don't need to, to use an accurate device. 
because all you're doing is increasing the cost of the device, increasing the calibration costs, um, and it's just not needed. So knowing the level of accuracy you need is very important. We'll now look at some of the costs associated with uncertainty. So, for example, if we were producing 8 to 1 million barrels of oil per day at a cost of 89.79 barrels per day, with an uncertainty of 0.25%, the total cost would be 7.27 billion that could be raised from the selling of that oil. With the financial expo exposure by that measurement uncertainty being 0.25% means that you could be losing potentially 18 million dollars per day. And that 0.25% is just obtained by measuring 7 point, by multiplying 7.27 billion by 0.25%. So you can see, having a, when you're looking at fiscal measurements, it's very important that you have very high levels of measurement uncertainty. Another example is if you're basically you're filling your car, you're paying £1.45 per litre, and the uncertainty you get from the pump is only 2% at 95% confidence limits. That means for a fuel tank of 50 litres, you're going to have a measurement uncertainty of 50 plus or minus 1 litre per second, uh, plus or minus 1 litre at 95%. Now, pumps are actually a lot more accurate than that. I think by law they have to be. Uh, a level of 0.5 percent so that would obviously in this case give you a much better um, uncertainty so if you were to fill your car up once once, once per week with 50 liters at one pound 45 you would that would give you the uncertainty of 72.5 plus or minus 1.5 under 95 percent confidence limits so if you did that once a week, every week for two weeks, that could potentially mean that you could be losing £75 just on the £1.45% uh, uncertainty level. So you can see understanding uh, uncertainty can give you a lot, an awful lot more knowledge about the measurements that you're actually making. We'll now go to a bit more detail about the types of uncertainty. So typically there are two types of uncertainty, uh, type A and type B. Type A generally comes from measurements and from calibrations where you're actually physically measuring the calibration of the device. Type B can come from the specification or any certificates you obtain from the manufacturer etc so first of all we'll look at type A and this is basically just an analysis of repeat measurements uh, so you're repeating the measurement through the device a number of different times um, the repeats will never agree because we've, we've already stated that the true value will never be known and what you do is you you'll actually build up a series of um, estimated points so you can see we have a range of, of, of test points and if you carry on these ranges this would actually form a normal distribution generally so <coughs> the best estimate of the true value between those points is going to be the average so simply adding the numbers up and dividing by the number of points And that gives you an average of about 70, 73.6, I think it is. What you could also do is you could use the highest and lowest values. But again, that ignores the majority of the data. So the way it's actually performed in practice is you look at the spread or you look at the standard deviation, the variation of the, of the values. So you, can, you can see there the 10 values that you've just taken from your flow meter so they've been calibrated and they've been calibrated to give those values 
So then you would take your average, which in the case is 73.52. And what you would then do is you'd look at the difference between your average and the measured value. And that would give you your difference shown below. Because we're not particularly interested in the direction of the difference, we, we don't really need the negative values. We then just square the values and that gets rid of the negative and you can see the squared values are shown there. We would then just add the sum of the squares together, which would give us 0.5676. Take the average of the squares and then take the square root, which would give us 0.253. And all we're doing really is look, calculating the standard deviation of that set of data. Now, we, we, we said earlier that one standard deviation is the same as one it is the same as little u, which is the standard uncertainty. So by doing all that measurements and, take, and doing that calculation, we can actually get the uncertainty of the values that we've actually measured. So it's quite a simple process, you know, especially if, if this is all done on a spreadsheet, it's quite easy to calculate the standard deviation and therefore get the standard uncertainty. As I mentioned earlier, most measured values will form a normal distribution when you uh, look at them. Uh, the standard deviation that we've just, sh we've just shown represents a confidence limit of 68% and represents one standard deviation on the normal distribution. So you can see in this case, with 68% confidence limits, the actual uncertainty would be 73.52 plus or minus the 0.253 that we just measured there. And that would be at 68%. If we wanted to look at the expanded uncertainty, which is the uncertainty relating to a standard deviation of 1.96, this would give us a, a larger range to look at. And we know from the previous one of the previous slides to actually achieve that, you just multiply the coverage factor by the, stand, by the standard deviation. So this just shows you the, the values of the coverage factors that you can expect to see. So with a, with a standard uncertainty at 68%, the coverage factor will be one, because that represents one standard deviation. 90% is 1.68 standard deviations, 95 is 1.96 and so on. So once you've got the coverage factor you can then convert any of your measurements back to standard uncertainties, which is what you have to do when you actually do it looking at an uncertainty budget for a particular um, for a particular case. And I'll show you how that's done uh, with one of the later slides. So type B um, uncertainty analysis. So this can come from things like uh, engineering judgment. Manufacturers' data, data, manufacturers data uh, calibration certificates. Um, usually, they're quoted at 95% confidence limits, so that's uh, with a K factor of 1.96. So, by knowing the actual uh, confidence limit that the data is um, detailed at, you can actually get, get it back to standard deviation by knowing the coverage factor. And this just shows you how, how to do that. Obviously, to get it back to standard deviation, you divide your expanded uncertainty by the coverage factor, and then that allows you to quote all your uncertainties for a particular measurement in the same standard uh, uncertainty level, uh, 68%. Because you will see a range, you will see data quoted at a range of different um, confidence lim limits. And you'll also see data that's not uh, related to a normal distribution. You may have a rectangular distribution, which will affect the, the confidence limits. You may also have skewed distributions, depending on the measurements that have been made and on the device itself. So that's just a repeat of one of the earlier slides. It just gives you an idea of what the different coverage factors actually are. It's always a good idea to try and remember these numbers because it, do, it will allow you to, to, to go between the different confidence levels. And when you're actually doing a measurement uncertainty calculation, 
you always need to work back to the standard uncertainty at 68 percent so it's, 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 it's a good idea to remember these numbers because they're just then a simple simple multiplication factor you're not always going to necessarily see a normal distribution um, in this case with a rectangular distribution the true value may lie between two limits with an equal probability of it lying anywhere in which case you're going to have a different level of uncertainty which you see by that little um, equation there so it's important to realize when you're actually trying to do a measurement of uncertainty calculation where the data came from how is it presented is it a normal distribution is it um, from a rectangular distribution what are the confidence levels that the, the, the data is quoted to? Because all these numbers, all these facts are going to be uh, input into the uncertainty budget at the end of the process. It's also important to realise if the data you get is, is actually correlated or not. What can actually happen is, in this case, we've got two distinct flow measurements. The two flow meters have been calibrated under two completely different conditions, therefore they have two different uncertainties. In this case, you would just use your standard approach of square root of the, of the sum of the squares, because there's no correlation whatsoever between the two devices. But what you can see is, in this case, if you have um, two meters that have been calibrated by the same condition, they have the, they were calibrated on, the, on say the same test facility. They have the same uncertainties then they are considered to be correlated together um, and in this case you wouldn't take the square root of the sum of the squares you would just actually physically add the two values together now it can be quite um, difficult to determine whether your values are correlated or not so what's generally recommended is you you want to take the calculation for both assuming that they're correlated and, and uncorrelated and then use the highest uncertainty that you generate from the two calculations yeah, as i said uh, it, it generally if the positive positive correlation we treat them as correlated if they're a negative correlation we treat them as uncorrelated but typically if you just do if you just do both methods of calculation and then just pick the highest that's probably the easiest way of handling any issues due to correlation so if we look at the calculation stages typically um, it follows eight stages first of all sorry about that first of all you would identify your sources so these are the measurements that you're actually making in practice you then calculate you then estimate the magnitude which is the actual value you're actually obtaining from your measured values you then look at the actual level of uncertainty that those measurements are actually given whether they're 95 percent or whether they're 68 percent but what you do is you convert all your uncertainty measurements back to standard values so these are some of the sources that you could uh, potentially be identified you've got things like the operator skill the environment installation effects drift over time repeatability calibration so you've got to try and look at all these different types of uncertainties to see if they're going to have an effect on the the measurement that you've actually made you've also got environmental issues such as temperature pressure humidity noise vibration and again these things need to be considered as well so you actually identify these uncertainty level sources from knowledge of your system experience of previous measurement uncertainties you've calculated uh, experience of it, instru similar instruments that you've used in the past you can use engineering judgment on the on the measurements that you uh, you make and it's always better to overestimate than underestimate you always want to overestimate any potential errors so that you're quoting a 
higher than you expect in terms of the budget for your process. So once you've got those first three um, cases, you then look to calculate the sensitivities. You then convert them to output values and estimate the degree of correlation. So the insensitivity is if you make a if you make a small change in the actual measurement that you make, that's going to have an effect on the output um, on the output measurement. So for example, if you're measuring the volume of a tank, if you make a small change to the diameter, that's going to have an effect on the actual volume of the tank. So it's important to realize how the the various uh, measurements you make are actually connected to each other. Um, so for example, for a simple um, volume of a tank, which I'll look at in a little bit as an example, if you change the diameter or the height by a small amount, that's going to have an effect on the volume. And it's the actual volume, which is the, the actual measurement that we're trying to measure the uncertainty of. So you just, you just actually calculate the sensitivity um, to your measurement for the out for the actual output you then combine um, the various uncertainties the expressive confidence limit and that's your um, process completed so this is typically a um, uncertainty spreadsheet that we use in practice so first of all, you've got your measurement. So this is the actual measurement you, you, you take. So for, so for example, with the volume of a tank, that will be diameter and height. You then put the actual value that you've measured. So that's the actual measured value of your height and diameter, the units that it's in. And then you list your level, your source of uncertainty. Now that could be drift, it could be a calibration of your device. You then list your expanded uncertainty your coverage factor and that allows you then to determine your standard uncertainty u c is your sensitivity so therefore if you times sensitivity by the uncertainty that gives you cu and then you just square that value so you can see at the moment we've worked uh, left to right across the spreadsheet what happens now is we work up, up, uh, up to down so you would then add all the uncertainty values are your C dot U squared values and then divide out C to get the un standard uncertainty and then using the coverage factor to get your expanded uncertainty and, th and the volume and the, and the units will be your actual volume that you calculated from your measured values so that's quite complicated but if we look at an example So this is just an example of a cylindrical storage tank and what we're measuring is the diameter and the height. The equation that we use to calculate the volume is simply pi d squared over 4 times h. So that equation determines the output value that we're actually going to determine. So by making small changes in the diameter and the uh, height we can then calculate the uncertainty, sorry, the, the sensitivities to any changes in those di in, in those variables for the actual output. So this will show you a, a completed table. So the measurement we've got diameter and height. We've got the actual values that we've measured physically. So that's 4.8 and 5.3 meters. The units are in meters. We've identified the sources of uncertainty. So in this case, that's the calibration of the device being used to measure the, 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 the diameter, the repeatability, and then the drift on the instrument due to time. We calculate the expanded uncertainty, whether that's through under calibration, looking at the standard deviation of the normal distribution, uh, or looking at uh, we've got there if you look at the prob probability distribution you can see the first two uncertainties are normal so they're under the normal distribution the third one is rectangular so what we're saying there is that we have this, the same probability of between two limits 
of the device being within that um, 1.73 coverage. So what you then do is you um, determine your standard deviations by just using uh, the expanded uncertainty and the K value. You calculate your sensitivity. So in this case, by making small changes in the diameter, that will have an effect, that will have a potential effect of changing the volume quite largely because small, small changes will make quite a large, um, have a quite a large effect on the volume. We then multiply C by U, take the square of it. Then we add the squares together to get us to 2.53. We square root them to get to 1.59. In this case, C is one because we've already accounted for the sensitivity sensitivities. So therefore, the standard uncertainty is 1.59. We're assuming um, an, an expanded uncertainty of, is what we require, so we use a coverage factor of 1.96. We're assuming a normal distribution, and therefore that gives us an expanded uncertainty of 3.12. So what that tells us is that the measurement that we made at 95.86 meters cubed has an uncertainty of plus or minus 3.12 meters cubed with a 95% confidence limit. So you can see once you actually understand the process, it's, it's really quite a simple um, process to actually determine the uncertainty. The difficult bit is actually identifying the sources of uncertainty and determining the uncertainty associated with those um, different sources. So it's important to always make sure that you convert back to standard uncertainties when you do any calculations to make sure everything's in the same unit. Always round up because it's better to overestimate than underestimate. And keep asking does this feel right. This can be quite a complex process overall. Um, so if, you don't, if you're unsure, ask for help. There are lots of people out there uh, that do these on a regular basis. This is something we have to do yearly for all our test facilities to ensure that we're still UCAS accredited. So we have an uncertainty budget for all our test facilities. Um, so we do an awful lot of these. So if, you, if you're uncertain about the process, we'd, we'd be more than happy to help. And that about covers it. I'm a, I'm a little bit early, um, but are there any questions? As I said, this that was a very brief introduction to measurement uncertainty. We usually do the, a full day, full one day course, going through all the processes in detail. So I have skipped through some of the processes quite quickly. But if you're more, if you're interested in getting more information, please just come and speak to me, and we can talk about it. Mm -hmm.